This is Karen with NewClevelandRadio.net, and it is time for Avoid the Maze. Avoid the Maze will take you on a journey. We're all on a journey, and uh, it may be the one that you planned when you were that five-year-old little girl or boy, you know, playing, and you said, I know exactly where I'm going to be when I'm an adult. Um, I really thought I did. But I'll tell you, I've taken many different paths. Today we have Christina Cast. And I know I'm going to mess up the last name. I'll let you do it for me, Christina. <laughs> Everyone messes up my name, so do not worry about that. Castanini. <laughs> Castanini. Okay. Um, and Christina's been on her journey like everybody else. And sometimes we think we're the only ones who find those speed bumps along the way. But the reality of it is um, we all find them. And you know what? It's up to us to either walk around them, climb over them, or just barrel right through. So Christina, tell us a little bit about who you are and uh, how you got from that little girl to the adult you are today. Oh my goodness. Yeah, I love how you said that. We all find these speed bumps, right? Uh, gosh, life does not turn out the way you think. Um, gosh, little girl. So um, I was born in uh, the East Bay of uh, California near San Francisco. And uh, my grandparents were immigrants actually from Italy. So um, grew up with this mentality of, you know, work really hard to, to make something of yourself because they came here with literally nothing. Um, and so just saw my family working with, you know, they came here with no education, nothing. And um, so I didn't really have, uh, you know, role models for education or college or anything. Right. Um, so, you know, just a little bit of a background from that, like, <laughs> um, to, you know, when you hear later where I ended up. Um but, you know, just real tight knit family, um, family was everything and didn't really understand uh, American culture that much. The family was everything. And, um, you know, we just all kind of hung out together and Sunday dinners and the whole shebang. So um, I didn't really think much what I wanted to be when I grew up. <laughs> OK, that's um, fair. But but I did kind of feel like I had a calling really young, um, which was interesting. So um, when I was about 12, um, one of my best friends dad's handed her a uh, an article from the local paper and he said hey you got it you got to give this to tina she's everyone's always going to her to talk about everything and they were um and it was an ad for a teen advice columnist like a dear abby if you will um and i got out my my typewriter <laughs> <laughs> we didn't have computers back then um and it, the it was basically they had mock questions and i was supposed to answer them as if i had the article and Next thing I know, I had the article and I had the local, you know, teen to teen column. And um, so that that was my first experience with kind of helping people and, and you know, just felt like, wow, this is interesting. This is kind of natural. And um, so, again, you know, didn't really have role models for going off to college. And in my culture, you don't really leave the house till you're married. So... <laughs> I'm 17 graduating high school and I'm the first one to move uh, a female at like that to move out of the house for college. Wow. Yeah. So that was a big, like, wow, what's going on here. Um, but I really felt like I wanted to help people. And initially I thought I wanted to go to med school. Um, and I had in my mind, like being a psychiatrist or something. Um, so I took all this pre-med courses and, um, I also kind of dabbled in taking some site courses in general eds and I thought, gosh, you know, that's really fascinating. I was just really pulled to those courses. And, um, like you said, you, you don't know where you're going to end up. I had taken the MCATs for med school and I had all my med school apps, like kind of ready to go. And I got out of my abnormal site class and I went, I don't want to go. I don't want to go to med school. And my, I think my parents were like, what? You're just studied all that time and you know you took this test and I went no I want to go to grad school and it was like this light bulb moment and I just went and I found which schools were still taking applications and um there was one school Pepperdine in um Southern California that had a master's program in marriage and family therapy and I applied and 
I got in and I was kind of shaking when I got in. I went, oh my gosh, (laughs) here's my life. Uh, Totally unexpected. Um, And that was a two-year program. And, uh, you know, that that just changed my whole world. That was like, it just was everything. Yeah, it just changed everything. Um, I just kind of knew like, okay, this is it. And um, so again, here's another speed bump, right? (laughs) something else I wasn't expecting. I thought, okay, I'm going to go right into my doctoral program. I get into a school up in the Bay area, which I wanted to go back near my family and they lose their accreditation. Oh and my like, gosh. No, wow. I can't go there. Oh my gosh. What am I going to do? Um, and it was just fate. I think it was, um, my grandfather got sick right at that time and it was his last two years of his life. So I was home and, ended up working, um, in human resources actually, but I was glad I was home. And, um, he really pushed me before he died. He's like, you go get your doctorate. So, um, and then I, I ended up at uh, USC for my doctorate in psychology. And, uh, this is the path for my career that I ended up on. Um, so that in terms of my career, that's how things kind of panned out. Sure. Um, You know, it's interesting because you touched on two things that I'm hoping our listeners really get. Um, Your family uh, immigrated here from Italy. And if we look at the United States as a whole, we've all immigrated from somewhere. Um, Mm -hmm. And I love it when people tell me, you know, I don't know any immigrants. Well, go back your parents, your grandparents, your aunts, your uncles, somebody. Um, And because so many of us have family that came from Europe and the Far East, um, the cultures, like you said, um, it was different in every little group. Um, I know in my family, yes, my parents wanted me to go to college, but it was most important that my brothers went to college. Um, Mm -hmm. And if I would have said I didn't want to go, I don't think they would have been heartbroken. Uh, I think they would have, you know, said, we'll put this money aside for something else. But cultures sort of determined what we were going to do. I know as a little girl, I really thought I know exactly what's going to happen. I'm going to meet my, you know, prince. I'm going to get married. I'm going to have a family. I'm going to live down the street from my parents. Every Sunday, we're going to have dinner together. And no, it never happened that way at all. And yet, all those little speed bumps and tips and turns that we take in life, if we are mindful, we're getting to the place where we really want to be. And that's what it sounds like you did too. You may not have known about college or if that was something you wanted to do, but when it became available, you could see certain paths that you could take. And you also mentioned that uh, you thought of becoming a doctor because you wanted to help people. And the reality of it is we all can help people. We don't have to have a specific career. Um, You know, obviously, as a trained uh, psychologist, um, you know, you can do more than I can when it comes to helping people. Um, But that's okay. We can all do our share. So I'm sorry you had to lose your grandfather, but I'm glad your grandfather gave you that push and said, hey, see this through. Um, So once you got your doctorate, um, did you just think, okay, I'm here. Now I can sit back and just do my work. Oh, no. <laughs> no, no. <laughs> a lot of steps to this, right? The, before you can um, get licensed, there's all these hours you have to accrue and a postdoc. And, um, you know, then it's really establishing yourself in terms of like who you are in the field. And so I felt like there's still so much more to go. Um So no, not at all. I think even getting the doctorate was exhausting. There's a dissertation. There was just so many things. Um, I was just happy that I got a postdoc. (laughs) I was able to get my hours for my license and then sitting for my license, you know, exam and praying that I passed, you know, there were so many things that 
went along the way that, oh gosh, it was, was a long haul. Um, but thrilled when I, I did get a, a job after I was licensed and, um, I was actually at that job for 15 years. Um, I worked at a hospital and, um, I thought I was going to retire there, <laughs> you know, I mean, I had seen everybody in my family work jobs for at one place and retire. And that was that. Um, so that was my mentality too. And, um, if anyone would have told me I was going to leave there before retirement, I would have been like, never, are you kidding? Um, it was stable, right. <laughs> but, um, I realized I wasn't practicing the way I wanted to there. And, um, I have kind of an entrepreneurial speak, uh, streak in me as well. And I, I realized after 15 years, I was sitting beside, behind the same four walls and I wanted to make a bigger impact. Like you said, you can help people in different ways, right? Yes. Um, and that kind of hit me. And it was a real hard thing for me to do because I was sitting there and I'm a single mom with two kids, young kids. And I'm going, I have the golden handcuffs. I have all this vacation accrued after 15 years, I've got the benefits I've got, uh, I've hit the highest on the pace. What am I doing? <laughs> am I really going to leave? But uh, what am I thinking? They're in elementary school. No, this is dumb. Um, but I just said, I got, I got to leave. I've got to get out there. And I want, I, well, I'm an eating disorder specialist too. Um, back when I was younger, I had an eating disorder and um, I never wanted to specialize in that, but again, along the way, what ended up happening was people would come in at the hospital. You kind of have to treat whatever walks in the door, but I found that, um, people who had eating disorders were really connecting with me in ways that, uh, they didn't have to say a whole lot. And I got it. And I realized in my path and treatment, if I'd had one therapist who maybe had been able to understand me because they had walked the path that would have really helped. So I said, you know what, this, this is my calling here. Um, and when I was at the hospital, I, I heard all these myths. I heard all these things, um, about eating disorders that was really pissing me off. I'll be honest with you. And I went, I want to get out there and like, try to do my part to break these myths and spread the word and get information out there. And I can't do it here. I, I'm too busy. And I, I, it just, I can't. So I left and I started my private practice full time. And I said, if I'm leaving, I'm going to do a podcast. And I did. And that was the scariest thing. You know, you do a podcast. Yep. I don't know how you felt, but I looked at my microphone for three months and I went, <laughs> what am I doing? I can't get on there. Nobody's going to listen to me. Um, but yeah, so well, here I am two, two plus years later. So. And you're, you're succeeding and that's, what's important. And when I, when I say you're succeeding, we all measure success differently. I had this conversation this morning. Um, I had somebody who called me to uh, consider joining our team here at new Cleveland radio. And they said, so how many hits does your show have? And how many hits does that show have? And I said, you know, I do have the data. And if you really want it, I can send it to you. I don't look at it daily. I don't look at it weekly. I don't even look at it monthly because number one, there are millions of podcasts on right now. And all you need is a phone to podcast. Let's be honest. Um, you know, it may not be the best quality, but people are doing it. But my comment was, I too wanted to help people. And that's what I was looking for in a career my whole life, but I wanted to help them by learning from them and them learning from me. And I think that's what makes us the most successful. And I think you sort of said that if you would have had a therapist who had walked in your shoes, who really could understand, you could have learned more from them than having somebody who was, you know, doing the routine treatment. Um, my son went through something very similar to that too. Um, he was diagnosed on the autism spectrum and every therapist, you know, you know it, they didn't do cognitive behavior. This kid at five needed cognitive behavior. You know, I'll tell you why I'm doing this. And they didn't want to hear it. Everything was reward. 
and he'd walk out of a therapy session. He'd look at us and go, I don't care if I earn a nickel. I don't care if I earn a new game. I'm going to do what I want to do. And we would look at him and say, but you just made a promise to the therapist. And he said, that therapist doesn't know me. And it wasn't until he was in his early 20s when he found a cognitive therapist that all of a sudden he became enlightened in life. He could connect. So we all can help each other in many ways. And I'm sure your podcast is helping a lot of people because they want to hear the everyday conversation. So I'm going to take you back a little bit. And you talked about the fact that you can resonate with eating disorder. So for those of us who don't really understand it, okay, um, I don't have an eating disorder, at least not that I'm aware of. Um, there are some times that um, I wish I could find a way not to eat as much or to eat more. Um, I'm always in that flux. And yet I always worry about people that I know who are going through this because I don't know what to say to them. So tell us, is it a medical issue? Is it emotional or is it a combination of everything? Well, so it is uh, in our diagnostic manual. Um, and so it is a diagnosable illness um, and it can have medical complications, right? So people do die. It is from eating disorders, and it is the deadliest mental health illness. Um, people probably don't know that. Um, so it's it's something to not take lightly. Um, and I do take that very seriously when I'm working with somebody. Um, so I, it takes a team. So how I approach it is, you know, if somebody's working with me, I do have them work with a medical doctor for, you know, monitoring their vitals and things like that. Um, Cause you never know what's going on on the inside of somebody's body. You can't look at somebody and know what eating, which eating disorder they have, and you don't know their health status. So I always right. want to make sure we look at that. Um, but it, it it's not about the food. It's about the food, but it's not about the food. So it, you know, the eating disorder is not really the problem. It's a symptom of some underlying problem. Um, and so food's being really used as a coping mechanism, if you will, I guess, for, um, I guess that's the easiest way to put it for something else. It's really like, why, why is this happening? What are you, it's usually about control. So maybe something like, you know, feels very out of control in somebody's life. And so this is the rules, the rituals, the routines, the measuring of the food, the amount of exercise, number of calories, whatever it is, is the one thing they feel like they can control. And so that's what they fixate on. Um, because, the, you know, their mind is occupied with all of this and their life is consumed with the eating disorder behaviors and thoughts and feelings. And it's a great way to numb out from or escape from whatever's really hurting. Makes a lot of sense to me. Um, you know, I know when I've been through bouts of depression, um, eating is something that I stay away from. Um, and uh, I've, I had to be reminded about 10 years ago when I was going through it, my husband said to me, are you eating? Mm -hmm. And then he made me come down to breakfast with him. He didn't make me eat, but he made me come down to breakfast. And I started getting into a routine. Well, if he's having a bowl of cereal, I'll have a bowl of cereal. In the beginning, it was appeasing him. And again, it wasn't, it was, I knew what my problems were and I got the help that I needed. But that's when I started realizing I don't understand it. And I have very, a, a number of friends who are still going through this in their 60s and 70s, and they've been fighting it their whole life. So it's, I know it's a real problem. So when you left the hospital, you started your practice, two children at home, scratching your head, why am I doing this? Um, you probably came up with an answer. There were some, well, part of it, like I said, was I just was like, I can't do this my whole life. I didn't go through all of this and, you know, get all this education and to go through all this yeah. just to stay here and feel like I'm not making an impact. And I said, if I'm going to do it, I, I want to do it now. And 
Um, so there were several whys. Another one was I really wanted to be a good role model for my kids about um, having, you know, following your passion. Um, and, and I think the other thing too, is I wanted to be there for them more. I was so busy working and I felt like, gosh, you know what, they're not going to, they're just going to keep getting older and I'm going to miss out on stuff. So I felt like if I'm going to try to have more flexibility and say in my schedule and my time, I'm only going to be able to do that if I'm my own boss. So I'm, and it was great timing. I have to tell you because it was three months before the pandemic and I did kind of freak out a minute because I didn't know how that was going to impact things. But the reality was, is I ended up working virtually from home because my building closed yeah. um, and my kids ended up coming home to do school. So I could not have been there with them while they were home if I had still been working at the hospital because I would have been there and I don't know how I would have done that with them. So it was actually a blessing. And, you know, it's interesting. Many of us see ourselves on the wrong path. We want to make a change. And I'm sure you hear this from your clients as well, but it's not the right time. You know, I have to wait. I have to put X amount more money in the bank. I have to downsize. All these have tos. And the reality of it is if we wait till we've checked off all those boxes, we're probably not going to make a change. Um, when I went through leaving corporate America, um, I loved my job but I didn't like the culture around it. And it almost sounds like that's where you were too. I didn't mind working 40, 50, 60 hours a week because I loved my students. I loved seeing them succeed, but it was everything else around it. It was Friday mornings, getting into a room and telling your coworkers what your favorite food was because that's supposed to energize you. And it was like, I don't know, have a favorite food. And if I do, it didn't matter to me. I just didn't want to be where I was. And so when I made the change, um, I was the breadwinner. Um, my husband had a decent job, but mine paid a lot more. And I remember I had to come home and say to him, I'm depressed. I'm unhappy. I can't walk into that building one more day. Yeah. Expecting him to say, sorry, honey, we need your paycheck. Um, and I was ready to say, I know you need my paycheck, so I'll, I'll go back in. And the first thing he said to me was, then don't go back in. He said, I, I need a whole person, not a fraction of one. And so one of the reasons I love doing this particular podcast is for people to hear that, you know what? Our income dropped tremendously. We had to learn how to cut back. Um, if I was tired at the end of the day, it didn't mean that we were going to go out for dinner. It meant that, you know, I'm the cook in the house and I'm going to find something and we're going to eat it. Um, and at first I was resentful, but then I realized, hey, I love what I'm doing. I can smile. And it sounds like that's how you feel now. Oh my gosh. Yeah. I, I can't even imagine going back. I have to tell you, and just, I don't know how you felt about it, but just to be able to have a say in how I practice and how I do my job and how often I see people is just, I mean, there's no, <laughs> there's nothing I can say that's like better than that. It's amazing. Yeah. So tell us how you developed your podcast. What is your podcast about and what can our listeners gain from it? So I, I sat back and thought about it and I went, you know, I, I'm kind of wearing two hats at all times. I'm somebody who's had an eating disorder and I'm a certified eating disorder specialist. So I think that's interesting. So, <laughs> um, and, and it's interesting as a therapist because I, I was trained to kind of be neutral and not share anything and divulge anything with my patients. So, okay. If I, if I go about it as like me, myself, my personal self, not my doctor self, I'm going to divulge all these things and all my patients who listen or anyone who listens is going to know all about me. That's, that's scary. And against what I've been doing my whole career. Um, but if I only go about it as a professional, it seems a little stuffy and like, 
that wouldn't be helpful because when I was going through my eating disorder, I think what I needed was to know other people who were going through it and hear their stories because all I thought I was doing was failing at dieting. And so, I mean, that's what I thought for years until I really heard other people talking about it. I went, oh my gosh, wait, what? (laughs) This is an illness? I'm just not failing at dieting. Oh my God. And then I felt not alone. Right. So I said, I'm going to come at it from two ways. I'm going to come at it as I'm going to have professionals on there to talk about like, you know, the information that people need to understand eating disorders. And I'm going to talk as a professional and then I'm going to have real people on there talking about their stories so that people who listen, maybe who don't know they have an eating disorder can go, Oh my gosh, maybe I do. Or, they cannot feel alone and they can hear stories of transformation and recovery and go, wow, if they recovered and they, I relate to them, maybe I can recover too. Maybe I can get help. So uh, I have both on there. Well, first of all, I have to thank you for being open and honest. I know that again, um, as a therapist, that's got to be very difficult because you are told to stay neutral Um, even as a coach, that's your responsibility to be neutral, but because we all experience many different things in life, none of us are perfect human beings. Um, I find it very refreshing, uh, when a professional says, yeah, I, I know what to do, but at one time I didn't at one time. I needed help and I will always be in recovery. So therefore, you know, this is who I am. Um, I just had a conversation with one of my doctors the other day. Um, I've been having weird symptoms for two years. Everybody has said, oh, it's no big deal, no big deal. And then all of a sudden now I have four doctors who said, oh, this must be a big deal. Um, And they've run me through all these tests and now I'm finding out that whatever it is, is so minor, but because nobody wanted to take care of it in the beginning, in my mind, it got bigger and bigger and bigger. Um, and it had consumed me. It was Uh only, it was only today when my doctor called me and said, I know exactly what you're going through. Hmm. I went through this myself everybody felt that I was the professional. I should have even known about my own health. And he said, so I went through all these tests similar to you. And you know what? You're going to be okay. Gave me some ideas. Um, He's putting me into a therapy group for it because he said, you were misdiagnosed. And because of that, you tried all these things for two years. And it was like within minutes, I felt recovered. Now, mm. I got to be careful about that. But for him to share his story with me, it gave me more confidence. And that's what I love about what you're doing because your patients, your audience, they're going to relate. And hopefully, they'll get the help they need. Thank you for saying that. I, I'm hoping that's the goal, right? Um, yeah. That it helps somebody um, or it has some impact. So we'll say hopefully. So how long have you been doing the podcast? Tell us a little bit about that. Uh, it's just a little bit over a year. Um, yeah, that's every comes out every Thursday. Um, like I said, I have a, just a mix of people who come on and I try to find at least for myself professionals that I find inspiring myself yeah. um, and we'll have great information. Um, but it's been, it's been so great. You know, the people have been so vulnerable who've come on and um, the feedback, the DMS I get from listeners, it, you know, I think, wow, that's amazing. Um, you know, it's, it's been something I did not expect at all. So. And how can we find your podcast? So I am, I uh, have a website. It's uh, behind the bite podcast.com. Um, I'm also uh, on Instagram at behind the bite. Um, and then there's links to the podcast on Apple iTunes. It's on like Spotify and all the right. wherever podcasts are, but there's links to all that in there, but the, the website's probably the best place to go. 
Well, I'm so glad that you are providing this information, services, uh, and you're out on the West Coast, correct? Correct. Mm -hmm. So how are things right now there with COVID? Because I know here in Ohio, um, you don't want to go too many places. We've, we've had a high surge. So are things pretty calm there? Well, um, I actually had it over Christmas. I don't even know how I got it. Yeah. <laughs> so I'm so yeah. careful. Um, my son just got over it. Um, so in, I think in the last two weeks, I've known so many people who have had it. I think we're finally, at least in my little area, um, people are just getting over it. And so hopefully it's Hopefully it's on the downward turn, but I've, we'll see. I'm hoping. I'm not going to say much, but right. knock on wood. <laughs> well, I'm looking forward to the day when um, I can do some of my shows in person rather than everything on Zoom. Um, mm. I did enjoy doing that before COVID. Um, it just is sometimes really nice to be sitting actually across the table from the people who are joining you. But until that day, uh, we'll continue uh, doing them virtually and providing whatever help we can to our listeners. So Christina, I wanna thank you for joining us today. Uh, we will put all your information in the show notes so our listeners can follow you. And um, I just wanna wish you the best of luck. And um, it sounds like you're on a really happy path. Thank you. And thank you for all you're doing too. And, you know, I know we are not across from each other, but I guess we wouldn't have been able to connect any other way if you're, we were doing it in person. So you're, you're absolutely correct. <laughs> uh, I don't have the budget to travel that far right now, but you never know, <laughs> maybe soon Yay. again. Thank you very much. Have a great evening. Okay. Thank you. Bye. Too. Now. Bye. Bye.